Well, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Lingam Gopal. For some of you who may not know me, okay, I was a consultant here for a long time, and uh, I quit a few months back. So, got to see Dr. Minachi. I've been given an opportunity to interact with you, and she's asked me to talk to you on pupils. So, uh, unfortunately, however much I condense it, it's in a lecture like this, unlike in a conference, if I am rapid and try to finish it in a fixed amount of time, then it's a wasted lecture because you will not understand anything I said. The, image, the message will go above your head. So I'm not going to take time, so it's going to be a little elaborate, but uh, I will give a break in between, break to exercise your uh, brain a little bit in between. So we'll ask a few questions in between so that uh, you also have understood what I said. Anything much? Yeah, yeah, please. Good evening, everybody. And uh, Dr. Lingam Gopal was not introduced formally to you because we don't consider you having left. <laughs> so, um, and some of you might be wondering how come Dr. LG is speaking on neuro ophthalmology? He actually, uh, we joke and say he can speak on just everything and anything. He is the encyclopedia of ophthalmology. Uh, but to keep uh, the piece at home, maybe glaucoma, he doesn't venture. Uh, that's that's sort of a joke, but um, but for, for a long time, Dr. LG used to take care of neuro ophthalmology here, along with vitre retina and, and several other things. Um, but pupils, I particularly requested with that uh, because of his um, approach, a systematic approach to everything uh, in medicine. And um, I, at this point, I'm, I'm just interrupting to ask you that with uh, Dr. LG's busy schedule, we're hoping that we can catch him once a month to uh, do classes for us and chair grand rounds. But if, uh, and so if you have any particular topics in vitreretina or neuro-ophthalmology or anything in ophthalmology that you really feel needs to be broken down and explained and so that you can assimilate it, please let me know and I will convey it to sir. Sir, thank you once again thank you. formally for oh, accepting no to do, do this and uh, really looking forward to our uh, your continuing to come here. Thank you very Thank much. You. Because I am here for one week every month, free, sitting idly in my house. So all these consultants are very busy. I know how they are busy because I used to be busy here when I work. So they won't have time to go into the depths and prepare for things which are not in their daily routine. You ask them to about stabismology, she'll probably talk without any preparation. But you ask her to talk about the anatomy or physiology or optics or something like that, then you, know, you need to prepare, otherwise you can't talk just like that and they won't have time. Well, I have the time. So you can utilize my time, no problem, okay? So that's what I said, okay? So it's not that this topic cannot be covered by consultants of Ritralaya, they all can very easily cover it. But I have the time to prepare for it, so I'm able to present it in a format that you can understand because I like to bring it things down to a level where I can easily understand. So if I can easily understand, I'm sure anybody else can easily understand. So that's how I bring it down to that level, okay? So we'll cover this subject in the following headings. Relevance, relevant anatomy, clinical evaluation, pharmacological testing, and abnormalities. So before we proceed, I assume that all of you are um, residents and uh, people who are in various uh, stages of this uh, first year, second year, third year, like that, right? All of your residents, all right. Not those who have completed ophthalmology, all right. So just to introduce the subject, we have pupils are round in humans, but they're horizontally oval in horses and vertically oval in cats. Why it is so? It's just that the pupillary fibers are distributed in that way in horses and cats, okay? That doesn't have any relevance to us, but except that, you know, cats people is looked at with a little bit of, as a bad omen or something like that, right? All right. So what is the relevance of the people? Why do you need a pupil? So those of you who are good in photography will know why you need it. Because it controls the amount of light entering the eye. It improves the image quality because it improves the depth of focus, it reduces the chromatic and optical aberrations, but you can't keep on reducing the size of the pupil and expect to keep on improving the depth of focus, etc. It's not possible. Beyond a point, 
beyond about 1.5 millimeters or so, it loses its, its efficacy. Further reduction is of no value. It in fact degrades the image due to diffraction. Okay, so beyond a point, further constriction is of no value. Okay, you all know about the pinhole visual equity which we test routinely, right? So when you put a pinhole in front of the eye and ask them to read, you expect that the refractive error has got no influence on the visual equity, which is again a wrong inference. Is it can improve the vision, but not to the same level as refraction would. Number one, number two, high degrees of refraction, say minus 12, minus 14 diopters of myopia or a FAK eye. If you directly put a pinhole, he won't improve. You must at least bring them to vicinity of their emetropic power, like at least put a plus six or a plus eight, and then try to put a pinhole in front of them, then you get the best corrected vision, approximate best corrected vision, okay? So what is the anatomy of the iris in pupil? You got something called the anterior limiting layer, which is actually a little uh, bit of a layer which covers the entire surface of the iris with all the crypts, everything. It's not called as epithelium, okay? Remember that. There is no epithelium covering the anterior surface of iris. It's called an anterior limiting layer. It's a lot of collagen which is covered, converted into a bed sheet. Then you have the stroma, which contains pigment cells, melanocytes, collagen, hyaluronic acid, and radially arranged blood vessels. You've got the greater circle, arterial triad, arterial circle, and the lesser circle, right? The lesser circle which is inside the iris. The greater circle is in the ciliary body. Right? Then the muscular component is dilator pupillae and consistor pupillae. We'll talk about it a little more in detail. And posteriorly, you've got the double layer of pigment epithelium. If you remember that as embryology, you know the embryonic eye vesicle, okay? And then it forms a cup, optic vesicle, which is the outbudding of the forebrain or pro prosencephalon. And then it forms a indentation, becomes a cup, double layer cup. So the outer layer develops into what? An inner layer develops into what? Outer layer develops into? Uh, outer layer. Neural, neurosensory retina, not sclera. Sclera is from the mesectoderm. Mesoderm. Okay, this is a neurectoderm. Outpoaching from the brain is a neurectoderm, right? The ectoderm, such a surface ectoderm. Neurectoderm is from the neural tissue and mesoderm is mesenchymal tissue, right? So sclera is a part of the mesenchyma, mesoderm, not neurectoderm. So neurectoderm, the optic vesicle, pouching, optic cup, the outer layer develops into neurosensory retina, which is the nine layers, starting with the photoreceptor layer all the way to the ganglion cell layer, okay? While the inner layer develops into the retinal pigment epithelium, okay? Now, as you trace it anteriorly, the retinal pigment epithelium continues as the inner layer of the ciliary epithelium. And the neurosensory retina compresses into a single layer of outer layer of the ciliary epithelium. The inner layer is non-pigmented and outer layer is pigmented. And these two continue as the posterior pigmented epithelium of the iris. So in the iris, both layers are pigmented, but in ciliary body, the inner layer is non-pigmented, outer layer is pigmented. Okay? Is that clear? All right. So this is some other terms, the pupillary rough. This is called pupillary rough. This is very important because this tells you about the integrity of the sphincter. Okay? This is the anterior border layer. These are the vascular arcades. And this is the sphincter muscle here. And this is the anterior pigment epithelium and then posterior pigment epithelium, the dilator muscle. The dilator muscle I'll come to it a little later. It's not a continuous muscle, okay? The sphincter pupillae is packed in bundles. And each bundle will have with one nerve supply acts as a unit. And it is situated between the collarette and the pupillary border. Okay? The collarette and the pupillary border. This whole thing is sphincter. Okay? Dilator pupil is also called as a myoepithelium because it is not just, it's not like sphincter muscle. It's not a continuous bundle of muscles. It's actually a muscle fibers which merge with the epithelium, the anterior epithelium. That's why it's called as myoepithelium. It's also like called as syncytium anatomically, okay? And it is radially oriented 
and goes up to the iris root. There is always a crosstalk between the sympathetic and parasympathetic supply. Parasympathetic supplying the dilator pupillae and parasympathetic supplying the constrictor pupillae because it allows one to relax when the other is contracting. Now, I always uh, tell this example that if you are trying to open a door, if at the same time somebody is pushing the door from the other side, you can't open it properly, right? So you don't want the dilator people to be constricting at the same time when sympathetic people is constricting. So when there is impulse that goes for sympathetic people to constrict, the dilator people to constrict, then the constrictor relaxes. This is because of the crosstalk between them. Okay? So you will find that a few fibers of the parasympathetic system actually go in, innervate the dilator people and vice versa for this purpose to enable crosstalk. That's about the anatomy which is relevant to our people. Okay? Then let us talk about the autonomic control of the people. We all know that it is not under voluntary control. Okay? It is under autonomic control. So when you talk about autonomic control, we talk about the receptor, the afferent arc, the center, the efferent arc and the end organ. Right? Let us talk about each one of them. Receptor. What is the receptor for these people? reflex is mostly rods and cones. Okay? But we will come to it a little later. If there is anything else, we will come to that. Now, people used to believe once upon a time that there are a separate set of rods and cones which are needed for occipital cortex to receive image and another set of rods and cones to carry to the pupillary path. Now it is not accepted. Now we know the same set of rods and cones act to carry the image to the occipital cortex as well as carry stimulus for the pupillary constriction. Okay? How does it happen? We will come to a little later. So, important thing to remember, same rods and cones are responsible for vision and pupillary reflex. The conditions of the dark and light adaptation correspondingly use the relevant receptors for pupillary response. What does it mean? In the state of dark adaptation, which receptors work more? Rods. In the state of cone adaptation or light adaptation, cones act more. Same way, during pupillary reflex also, cones conduct more of pupillary response in light adapted situation and rods are involved more in the dark adapted situation. There is also something called as pupillary threshold and pupillary amplitude. Pupillary threshold is what is the minimum amount of light you require under the adapted circumstance. Somebody is very dark adapted, somebody is very light adapted. So under that circumstance, what is the minimum amount of light you require to induce a pupillary reaction? That is called as pupillary threshold. And that threshold is very low in a dark adapted situation. Okay? When a light adapted situation, the same light, level of light, say about 0 0.1 log unit or something, may not produce, induce any pupillary constriction at all in a light adapted eye. When a dark adapted eye, it can actually induce. So, dark adapted eye has got a lower pupillary threshold. But pupillary amplitude is for the same quantum of light that is thrown into the eye, how much is the constriction of people occur? Maximum pupillary constriction, the excursion between the dilated state and the constricted state. That is the amplitude, right? How much it can become smaller? So that excursion is higher in a cone-stimulated reaction, not a dark-stimulated, uh, rod-stimulated reaction. So you understand the difference now between pupillary threshold and pupillary amplitude, okay? Said there are, you also know the basic vision pathway, right? That is, light is captured at the level of the rods and cones and converted into electrical stimulus, right? And this electrical stimulus goes from rods and cones to the bipolar cells, okay? And from the bipolar cells goes to the ganglion cells. And then the nerve fiber layer is from the ganglion cell axon, okay? Two stages, three stages, right? Now, there is always a collapse between rods and cones level to the bipolar cell level. That means more than one rod or more than one cone may integrate with one bipolar cell. Okay, something called convergence. In neurology, this is a phenomenon called convergence. The degree of convergence can vary between cones located in the macula versus the cones located in the periphery. Obviously, in the macula, you require very fine vision. So fine processing is required. So it will be one is to one. One cone for one bipolar cell. But you go to the periphery, 50 cones may merge with one bipolar cell. Alright? 
but there are ganglion cells that have several varieties. There's one variety called I3 ganglion cells. There's I1, I2, and I3. The I3 ganglion cells are also called as melanopsin-containing ganglion cells. These are involved primarily in the pupillary reflex. So studies have shown that these ganglion cells are independently light responsive. Means even if we remove the rods and cones, if we have I3 ganglion cells, the pupillary reflex can still be intact. That's a very dramatic point because people never realized why even in some blindness caused by photoreceptor damage, pupils can still react. Okay? That is like reflex vision di uh, difference. So these I3 ganglion cells are melanopsin containing and they are exclusively project to the midbrain. They don't go to the occipital cortex at all. Okay? And they can be directly stimulated by light as well, even without the processing taken from photoreceptors through bipolar cells to the ganglion cells. Directly you can stimulate them with light. This is a very important point, okay? This is a new knowledge, okay? Got by a lot of animal experimentation. So there's a disconnect between the vision and the pupillary reflex. Those of you who have seen cases of optic neuritis would have seen visual activity improves with treatment to six by six. Fields are full. At the REAPD still. So REAPD recovers last. Although vision has recovered and fields have recovered. You wonder why, why it is so. Likewise, they have found, found in genetically modified rats where the photoreceptor is lost totally. Pupillary reflex is still retained. And circadian rhythm, you know what is circadian rhythm, right? That is, we wake up in the morning and we sleep in the night and there is some biological clock which, which, which reflects the day and night in the, in the outside, right? So when you see the light and all, it has a particular effect on your behavior. That's called circadian rhythm. That is maintained in patients with blindness due to photoreceptor loss. But not in those due to optic nerve disease. People who are blind due to optic atrophy sometimes lose circadian rhythm. Although it's not always true, but in general we're talking about it. It tells you that basically the ganglion cells, if I, I3 ganglion cells are intact, you can still have a good pupillary reflex. And circadian rhythm is all at this level, right? Pineal gland level. So it can be maintained. While if the entire optic nerve is cut off and ganglion cells also cannot communicate, I3 ganglion cells, then that is lost. Okay? So, so much about receptor for pupillary pathway. Next is afferent arc. We already said the axons of I3 ganglion cells travel via the optic nerve, via the chiasma, and into the tract. Okay? So far, so, so good. But before it leads, reaches the lateral genuclear body, I hope this part is clear for anatomy, right? For vision, it goes from the photoreceptors, optic nerves, and the chiasma, the nasal fibers are cross, temporal fibers don't cross. Then they go to optic tract from the chiasma. What's happening? Okay, the optic tract ends in the lateral genuclear body. And from the lateral genuclear body, optic radiation goes to the occipital cortex. This is clear, right? So in this, the pupillary motor fibers go up to the optic tract. And then before the lateral genuclear body, they deviate. Okay, these leave to the and go to the pretectal olivary nucleus. Again, pretectal olivary nucleus to remember as, as a name becomes sometimes difficult. But if you can put a image to the name, it's easier for you to remember. If you remember in the midbrain, okay, midbrain is above the pons, right? Midbrain, the dorsal part is called tectum, and the ventral part is called tegmentum. Okay? In between you got the aqueductus sylvius. The tectum has got superior collateral. There have got four bulges on the dorsal surface. It's called carpora quadrigemina. Quadrigemina is four. Carpora is four bodies. Superior colliculus, inferior colliculus. Okay, remember that. Then these four can, are called as tectum. Anything in front of it is called pre-tectum. This is between the superior colliculus and the part which goes in front of it is called pre-tectum. Okay, that is still a part of the midbrain. Pretectum is still a part of the midbrain. It is there that you have this olivary nucleus. All right, that forms the center for the pupillary motor processing. And yeah, again, just like the segment of the nasal fibers in humans 
50% roughly cross, 50% roughly don't cross. It's not the same in animals, right? In lower animals, for example, the non-primate animals, 100% cross, okay? So you find that the amount of crossing of the pupillomotor fibers is similar to the amount of crossing of the vision fibers, roughly the same, okay? And convergence is significant. I said the convergence is when more than one fiber is stimulating one cell, it's convergence. It is very significant at this level of Oliver nucleus. What is happening? Enough, Okay, the center for pupillary reflex is the Edingar Westphal nucleus, okay? Edinger Westphal nucleus, you know, is, is connected to the oculomotor nuclear complex, right? But it's located rostral to it. Rostral is superior to it, right? Caudal is below, all right? So from each pretectal nucleus, which itself is located at beyond the superior colliculus, fibers go to the Edinger Westphal nucleus. It's important for you to understand that from the pretectal nucleus, Fibers go to both the Edinger Westphal nuclei, not just one, and perhaps in equal amounts, which means for all practical purposes, once it has crossed the level of pretectal nucleus, Edinger Westphal nucleus stimulates stimulated both sides equally. This is a concept which is very important when we come to RAPD. Okay? So both pupils are equally stimulated, irrespective of from where the afferent stimulus has come right side or left side, afferent stimulus has reached the pretectal fibers. One from the pretectal fibers goes to both Edinger Westphal nuclei equally, and hence you're able to get pupillary constriction on both sides equally. This concept should be very, very clear, okay? These are located, as I said, dorsomedial to the third nerve nuclear complex. The degree of crossing of fibers in pretectal to Edinger Westphal again mimics the crossing at the chiasma in the evolution. As I told you, 100% in lower animals is crossed. The same thing is, is mimicked here as well. That's about the center. What about the efferent arc? Efferent arc is oculomotor nerve. The Edinger Westphal nucleus is located very close to the oculomotor nerve complex, right? Oculomotor nerve is called complex because oculomotor nucleus itself stimulates a lot of muscles or supplies a lot of muscles, including superior rectus medial rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique, and levator palpebrae superioris, right? So superior division goes to superior rectus and superior and levator palpebrae superioris, and inferior division supplies the rest of the three muscles, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique, okay? So we've got inferior division, superior division of the oculomotor nerve. Now, the branch to the inferior oblique, it contains a ganglion called as the ciliary ganglion. I'll come to a little bit later about ciliary ganglion itself. So in the ciliary ganglion, which is hanging on the motor root of the ciliary ganglion, is hanging on the branch to the inferior oblique. So physically it is located somewhere between the optic nerve and the lateral rectus. That is where the ciliary ganglion is located. And from the ciliary ganglion, the efferents, because ciliary ganglion is where these fibers synapse, parasympathetic fibers synapse. And the postganglionic fibers go through what are called short ciliary nerves into the eyeball. So in the third nerve itself, the pupillomotor fibers, fibers which are going to the pupil, they lie uh, initially superiorly, and then medially, and then inferiorly. This is also very important for you to understand. And, but they are all mostly located superficially, not in the middle of the nerve. Why inferiorly is important? Because in the subarachnoid space, if you have basal meningitis, pupils can be affected because they're located inferiorly, right? and they are located superficially. Why it's important to know it's superficially located? Because you know that most of these nerves get blood supply from radial plexi from the surface. So that the farther away the blood vessel goes, it, I mean the nerve is from the surface, the blood vessel has to go deeper to supply it, okay? So if you have a, a vascular problem, like in diabetic retinol, diabetic neuro, mononeuritis, as it's called as, where the small vessels get blocked. Then the chances are that the pupil can be spared because pupil is on the surface. So it gets adequate blood supply, but the central fibers may be affected. So you can have a third nerve, which is affecting the, all the muscles, but not the pupil. Okay? 
the, kind of the flip side of it is, is if there's a pressure uh, producing lesion like a malignancy in the eye, in the brain, it first presses the pupils first. So you may have an isolated pupil the internal ophthalmopegia, which may be a sign of a compressive lesion. So that is the importance of knowing that pupil low motor fibers are superficially located, okay? Coming to ciliary ganglion, we already told you, ciliary ganglion is located between the optic nerve and the lateral rectus posteriorly, okay? And it's about two centimeters behind the globe, okay? It's about one into two millimeters in size. It has three afferent roots and 20 efferent short ciliary nerves, okay? The afferent roots are basically, you got the, uh, the, the somatic root that is basically from the tight trigeminal nerve, now, nasociliary now. You got the parasympathetic root, which is what we told you just now from there. And then the third root is uh, the sympathetic root, which is a long ciliary nerves, okay? The cell bodies are all parasympathetic. So long ciliary, this parasympathetic only goes through the ciliary ganglion without synapsing. It's only a parasympathetic which synapses in the ciliary ganglion, okay? Now here, this is the ciliary ganglion, okay? You've got the sensory root, the sympathetic root, and the motor root, okay? The sympathetic root we'll discuss a little later. Sensory root is coming from the nasociliary nerve, and the motor root is coming from the oculomotor nerve, okay? And here, well, the only thing that synapses is the parasympathetic. And the ganglions, the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers go through short ciliary nerves. So this is very important. Only 3% of them supply. So only 3% supply the pupils. <laughs> And 94%, this is, I never understood this maths. 94 plus 3 is 97. What happened to the remaining 3%, I don't know. But Dr. Walsh and White says 3% supply people and 94% ciliary muscle. So we accept it. Okay? So the short ciliary nerves, which are the efferent fibers coming from the ciliary ganglion, they contain one, the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, postganglionic sympathetic fibers, also the ganglion. Is not in ciliary ganglion, it is somewhere else. Superior cervical, that I'll come to later. And sensory fibers of the trigeminal nerves. All three are present in the short ciliary nerves, which enter the eyeball. So in the eye, they penetrate temporal to the optic nerve and proceed in the supracoroidal space to supply the ciliary body and the pupil. Why do you need 94% for ciliary muscle and only 3% for pupil? Although you are always seeing the pupil, you, are not, you can hardly see the ciliary body, right? But because of this, the ciliary body has got a huge mass around and iris in people is so thin. So you don't require that many nerves to supply the people. That's why this disparity, okay? This is about parasympathetic. So this part is clear. So just go over it very quickly. We said the afferent arc starts with receptor, which is the photoreceptors. But we also said the I3 ganglion cells are also light sensitive. And they, they are involved in the pupillary projection to the midbrain, not I2 and I1 cells. And we also said that this afferent arc goes through the optic nerve, causes in the chiasma, just like the vision fibers. And before the lateral genital body, it leaves the optic tract and goes to the midbrain, where it goes to the superior, the superior brachium of the superior collectors. Brachium is nothing but those linking fibers. Okay, so superior brachium or superior colclus, but it terminates in the pretectal olivary nucleus. That's the first step. Then from the pretectal olivary nucleus, the fibers go to the both Edingar Westphal nucleus. And from the Edingar Westphal nucleus, the fibers go and join the oculomotor nerve. And from the oculomotor nerve, they go, they lay, they lie on the surface. And initially they are superiorly located, then they go medially, and then they lie inferiorly, but they can be damaged with basal meningitis, etc., etc. And then they enter, of course, the eye through the superior abdominal fissure, and then they are divided into two branches, the superior, in fact, the branches to superior and low inferior division occur in the cavernous sinus level itself, not at the superior abdominal fissure level. 
So even in the cavernous sense, you have superior and inferior division, right? And there, in the cavernous sense, they're located. Where are they located in the cavernous sense? Yes. So the only structure which is within the cavernous sense is the abducent, sixth nerve, okay? Well, both third divisions, fifth nerve, as well as ophthalmic and maxillary division of fifth nerve, they're all located within the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, okay? And then they enter the superior abducent, through superior abducent, which they enter the eyeball, the orbit, and there, the inferior division and the branch of the inferior oblique is what carries these parasympathetic fibers and they end up in the ciliary ganglion through the motor root which is located between the optic nerve and the lateral rectus and the efferents are the short ciliary nerves about 20 in number which contain not only the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers but they contain sympathetic fibers and the sensory fibers brought by the nasociliary nerve okay all these enter the eyeball through the sclera temporal to the optic nerve and then come forward, supply the ciliary body and the pupil. 97% go to, 94% go to ciliary body and 3% go to pupil. This is clear? Right. Now let's go to sympathetic system. Sympathetic system starts at the hypothalamus. Okay? Hypothalamus and then they go down into the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, they go to the cilio-spinal center of bud, which is between C8 to T2 level okay you all know that there are eight uh, segments as far as the spinal cord is concerned but there are only seven vertebrae right but c8 to t2 this is where the ciliospinal center of budge is located okay it's located uh, if you remember right anterolaterally now from this the white ramai communicantis which is a ventral motor root pass they go through the Sympathetic ganglion, there's a chain of sympathetic ganglion, right? So you've got the stellate ganglion, which is inferior most. Inferior cervical ganglion merges with the first thoracic ganglion to form the stellate ganglion, right? So they enter the stellate ganglion, but most common mistake students do is saying that it synapses there, it doesn't synapse there, okay? It goes through the stellate ganglion, ascends through the middle cervical and goes through the, and synapses in the superior cervical ganglion. Okay, superior cervical ganglion is not stellar ganglion. Stellar ganglion is inferior, right? Remember that. After superior cervical ganglion, it goes by multiple routes into the eye. It can enter the orbit through the, along with the long ciliary nerves, naso ciliary nerve and long ciliary nerves, sympathetic route of the ciliary ganglion and short ciliary nerves, and along the ophthalmic artery plexus. So three routes, it can enter the eyeball, right? So the postganglionic fibers, they supply intraocular muscles, mainly the dilateral pupillae through the long ciliary nerves. They supply the vessels in the orbit. They supply the smooth muscles of the Mueller's muscle, fibers to the lacrimal gland, and fibers to the melanocytes of the uveal tract. Importance of that, we will come to a little later. So, again to recap, it starts with hypothalamus and then goes down to the Ciliospinal center of budge, which is located between C8 and T2, anterolateral in the spinal cord. From there, the white ramai communicantes, which emit ventrally and join the sympathetic, ganglion, sympathetic chain, right? In the sympathetic chain, they enter at the level of the stellate ganglion, but do not synapse there, and then go ascend up and synapse with the superior cervical ganglion. So you got first one segment coming from hypothalamus all the way to the Ciliospinal center of budge, okay, that is one segment, okay, first neuron. Second neuron is starting from the budge and all the way to the superior cervical ganglion. And third neuron is from the superior cervical ganglion through multiple routes, some through the carotid plexus, ophthalmic artery plexus and come into the eye. Some go and join the naso ciliary nerve and come into the eye. Some form the long ciliary nerves and enter the eye, okay. So, those which join the nasal ciliary nerve will also join the ciliary ganglion and enter the eye through the short ciliary nerves. So there are three different ways that they can enter, all right? So now, you've got cortical influences. These are excitatory pathways from the occipital cortex, okay? So occipital cortex influences the pupillary size continuously. Some of these modulating near stimuli are located more ventrolaterally in midbrain than pupillomatter fibers, 
factory. These are not affected in the many pretectal tissues which produce light in association. I'll explain this a little later. Means in the midbrain, you've got the modulation of the near stimuli, near vision reflex, I'll come to a little later. So those are present little ventrolaterally in the midbrain than the pupillary fibers, which is why lesions can selectively affect one and leave the other one behind. That's where you get the light near dissociation. You won't get light reflex, but you get near reflex present still. Okay? In, in awake subject, or the other way around as well. So in awake subject, cortico-hypothalamic and cortico-limbic influences inhibit midbrain-derived parasympathetic outflow. There's a continuous outflow from the parasympathetic system at the midbrain level. But the sympathetic system, which is stimulated when you're awake by ascending reticular activating system, right, ARES. So that stimulates the sympathetic system. So when you're awake and the sympathetic system is active, it inhibits this, which is why if you are sleepy or you're sleeping and you're fatigued, people start becoming smaller because the sympathetic influence is cut off, all right? Which is why somebody who has acute angle closure glaucoma, okay, and they go after, or you are doing the so-called prone test for glaucoma in darkness. In darkness, they go off to sleep. When they sleep, the test is not effective because people become small, all right? So pain and arousal produce midriasis. And this midriasis is not eliminated by section of sympathetic trunks. So you wonder, why should a dilator act at all if the sympathetic trunks are cut off? It's because directly the dilator muscle can be acted by uh, spinocortical fibers and also even by liberation of the uh, chemicals into the body, the adrenergic hormones into the body, they go by bloodstream and act on the dilator people as well. Okay? So there's something called a dark reaction, which is not always mentioned in other textbooks of ophthalmology. Okay? That is the dilation which occurs on exposure to darkness. It is one, it is because you cut off the light stimulus, that is, you have inhibited the, uh, I mean, the parasympathetic is no longer being stimulated. Is it because of that alone? Or is it an active inhibition? That means, is darkness acting as a stimulus itself? It is felt that there are both. So dark reaction is actually an active phenomenon. It's not a passive phenomena caused by cutting off the parasympathetic stimulus. It's also caused by parasympathetic having a discharge from the retina. The darkness is acting as a positive stimulus. So this occurs even after sympathetic system is interrupted. Okay? This is dark reaction. Remember that. So I thought I'll give a short break so that I'll jog your cortical cells a little bit. Okay. So where is the anterior layer of iris epithelium located? Is it located in the anterior surface of iris, on the posterior surface of iris, or posteriorly behind the stroma? It is posterior behind the stroma. It is not located in the anterior surface of iris. Okay? We said anterior surface is a border layer, a boundary layer. But both the epitheliums are located posteriorly. Anterior epithelium being located in front, posterior epithelium being located behind. Both are located posterior to the stroma. Okay? Suppose they cut off a sectoral redectomy, I do. What happens to the pupillary contraction and light reflex? Is it totally knocked off? Do you get a fixed dilated pupil? Or the reaction is not affected at all? Does the intact part of the pupil still act? What happens? It's because we discussed in anatomy that nerve and a bunch of fibers act as a unit. So each segment can still contract. Okay? It may not be fiber by fiber, but at least one segment can contract. Okay? Iris pigmentation is influenced by sympathetic supply, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, to some extent, yes. To some extent also, it's the racial pigmentation also is there. Like uh, Westerners, Caucasians will be having little blue iridis. Not that they don't have sympathetic supply, they have it. Okay? So there's some racial pigmentation as well, but sympathetic, it comes from Harness syndrome. We'll come to that later. Intracranial lesions, let's come to intracranial lesions versus sympathetic involvement of people. Okay? 
Suppose there's an intracranial lesion which is producing sympathetic involvement. Does it produce only affection of the first neuron? Does it produce third, third neuron, not neutron, neuron? I think this is um, Bill Gates has corrected it, not me. Okay. It produces all three neurons involvement, or produces first and third neuron involvement, and produces first and second neuron, which is correct. Just remember what I said, sympathetic pathway. So first neuron is going from hypothalamus, which is intracranial, serospinal bridge over. Second neuron is serospinal bridge to superior cervical region. Entire thing is in the thorax and the neck. Third neuron is from superior cervical region entering into the brain again. So third neuron can still be affected, right? So technically, both first and third neurons can be affected with intracranial lesions, okay? Not simultaneously. I meant can be affected, okay? Okay, let's talk about physiological variations in pupil. Infants, the pupil is smaller due to relatively less developed sympathetic system, okay? As they grow, the pupils become larger. Even by the first month, second month itself, the pupil starts getting dilated better. Old age pupil again is smaller due to reduced tone of the sympathetic system and also probably reduced inhibitory influence on the edingal westphal nucleus. Individual variations will always be there, but they're always symmetrical. The pupillary size in X may be a little smaller than Y for the same ambient light. But between the two eyes, there's usually no difference. The pupillary excursion may be also related to individual structural variation. Means how much the pupil will contract, this amplitude can also be related to the individual structural variation. Okay? There's something called physiological anisocoria. Anisocoria is Difference in the size of people between the two eyes. Physiological anisocoria is, any difference between the two eyes is actually anisocoria. But clinically with the torchlight, you can detect only if there's more than 0 0.3 millimeter in size difference. But with infrared video pupillography, you can, do, you can identify even 0 0.1 millimeter difference, okay? So for clinical purposes, anything beyond 0 0.3 millimeters difference, you call it as anisocoria. So clinically, you can detect such an anisocoria in up to 12% of normal people. So in these 12%, the pupillary reflexes remain normal, okay? And the degree of anisocoria slightly reduces with light. Another phenomena, physiological, is called tornase phenomena. That is, relative dilation in the abducting eye and relative constriction in the adducting eye in a gaze, okay? But this is not consistently demonstrated. It's more of examination value. Somebody, some, some smarter like examiner may ask you, what is tornase phenomena, okay? Kippus is a word which you are all familiar with. It's a physiological pupillary unrest, but it's more in light, okay? That is, it keeps on going like this up, okay? Oscillatory pupillary movements are different. They are variations of pupillary sizes based upon degree of alertness. These are more slower variations than hippus. Hippus is more rapid, okay? What is normal pupillary light reflex? This is again the most important thing that you need to learn. That is light is shone into one eye. What happens then? Ipsilateral pupil constricts. That is called direct reaction. At the same time, contralateral pupil also constricts. It's called consensual reaction. But both are of equal magnitude normally. When the magnitude is not equal, when the direct is more than consensual, it results in what's called contractual anisocoria. This can be normal in the sense, if suppose in a given subject, everything is normal, except that anatomically, the edingar westphal nucleus of both sides is not getting equal stimulation from the pretectal nucleus of the same side. So if there are more fibers going to the ipsilateral edingar westphal nucleus, rather than the contralateral ring crystal. Suppose there's an anatomical variation, right? It can happen. If that happens, you can expect his direct reflex is going to be stronger than the consensual reflex. So there is a difference. So it can be mistaken with RAPD, right? We'll come to what is RAPD a little later. But in most people, it's a clinically irrelevant detect, uh, differences in the people reaction between direct and consensual. So for all practical purposes, from your examination point of view, 
pupillary reflex is always equal on both sides normally. Don't worry about this little physiological variation. Okay. Next, age and pupillary reflex. It's more brisk in adolescence and middle age. Less in infancy and less in old age. The briskness. So with increasing age, number one, there's decrease, decreased resting pupillary diameter. That is, pupil becomes a little smaller in size. We just not told that because of reduced sympathetic tone to the pupils. There's a reduced maximum constriction velocity. This is common sense. If you start with a five millimeter pupil, and if you put a minimum as 1.5 millimeters, it, the excursion is 5 minus 1.5, right? But if you start with a 4 millimeter pupil, it can only go up to 1.5. So the excursion is obviously reduced. But there's also reduced velocity, maximum constriction velocity, and reduced reflex peak. Peak is different from maximum constriction velocity, okay? Now, stimulus intensity and light reflex. As I already told you, there's a dark adapted eye reacts to low levels of light also, but with a long latency and shallow and of short duration. People does constrict, but not briskly to a very small level, nor is the speed of contraction good. And it's only for short duration like this, like this it constructs. But once the cone threshold is crossed, the reaction becomes very brisk. Brighter the light, shorter the latency, and more the excursion. These are all important till you reach nine log units beyond which it may not have any effect. So this is the importance of using very bright light when you test the people reaction. You don't test people with a dim light, okay? I remember when we were doing PG, we used to buy torch lights. We don't have LED lights those days, right? Torch lights with batteries which have been there in the torch light for the last six months. So they're about to leak acid and all that. So it won't act. So you shake like this, a little dim light will come. With that, if you check people reaction, you will never get the correct reaction, right? So what is the effect of color and pupillary reflex? They are related to the brightness. So brighter colors like red, okay, and yellow, they have more brightness in them compared to blue, which has got less brightness in it, right? So it is related to brightness, not related to the color, okay? Retinal topography, what influence it has on pupillary reflex. If you are able to make a collimated beam and stimulate parts of the retina, which is possible, but only in experimental animal setup, not in experimental laboratory setup, not in clinics with a torch light, it always scatters light. Even if you project it temporarily, light goes in the other side also because of scattering. But if you are able to do it and discreetly test each part for its pupillary response value, you find the retinal periphery is less efficient than the fovea when the bright light is used. But in dim light, it is the other way around. Peripheral retina has lower pupillary threshold than fovea. Fatigue and sleep will reduce the cortical inhibition of edinger westphal nucleus and hence produces meiosis, okay? Another phenomena which you need to remember is called westphal pilz phenomena, which is when you squeeze the eye, the pupils constrict, okay? So that's about physiological phenomena. So far it's clear. Sympathetic pathway, passive laboratory is clear. Okay, let's talk about clinical evaluation now. Okay? This is the next most important thing where you'll be asked in that exam to demonstrate how you check the people's reaction. Relevant history is symptoms due to the different size of the pupil. A large pupil, what do you expect the patient will complain of? Glare. Small pupil, what will you complain of? One eye small, I mean. Not both are small. Reduced illumination because less light is entering the eye. You see, so everything a little dim with the affected eye than the other eye if the pupil is smaller, right? You also ask the past history of trauma, herpes zoster, surgeries in the neck or thorax, consumption or exposure to pesticides, and exposure to opiates. Why pesticides? Because they have got anti colony stress effect, right? And professions, medical personnel, if you are a very clumsy person who handles dilating drops, spills it all over your fingers, but forget to wash the hands, and you rub your own hand, eye, the next day you'll be having dilated people, right? There's something called FAT scan, which is very interesting. That is family album tomography scan. Okay? That is, instead of ordering CT scan, 
in a patient with a unilateral dilated pupil, slightly dilated pupil, you look at the previous photographs of the child as a child, as an adult, etc., then you find probably that mild anisocoria has been there all along. Okay? It's called family album tomography scan. You look at the family album, basically. Pupillary size you document. You can use things like pupillary gauge. Many pharmaceutical companies give you, you know, pupillary gauges with their stamp of that uh, company also logo given on one side. This has multiple circles, different sizes. That's a pupillary gauge. You keep it next to the eye and compare and say two millimeters, three millimeters water. That is simplest. Smartphone based pupillometry is available these days. It's a small apps are available which you can download or purchase and then measure the pupillary size. This device you might have seen in optical shops, but there they use it for intrapupillary distance measurement. While there is one particular made by Gildan Optic Ophthalmics, which is actually used for pupillary testing as well. It measures the size of the pupil. Like this is a pupillometer. Okay? These use infrared light and hence are very useful to measure the pupillary size irrespective of the illumination. Okay? And is also extremely useful for dark people like us. For Caucasian eyes, you don't require anything. You just take a normal photograph, you can see the pupils beautifully. But for dark areas like ours, you can't see it. While this infrared is very useful in that. You also examine a slit lamp to rule out inflammation, which can cause pupillary constriction. Sphincter atrophy, which you can miss if you don't carefully examine. You think it's a dilated people and think of all kinds of syndromes, Harner syndrome and all that. But what he has is just a sphincter atrophy due to forgotten trauma. Okay? And look for segmental contraction. It's called as vermiform movement. Means parts of the iris contract at different times. Okay, it's called like a worm movement. It's called vermiform movement. That's common in eddies myotonic people and in aberrant regeneration. Okay? Aberrant regeneration if third nerve is damaged and then pupillary fibers again started to regrow, but they went all over the place. So fibers meant for say medial rectus also go to the pupil. Okay? Or Different parts of the pupillary sphincter is differently innervated, re-innervated. So you get different contractions. That's where you get vermiform motion. Okay? So pupillary evaluation, pupillary size, is it equal in both eyes or not? If not, is the anisocoria more in dark or light? The first question you ask yourself, are the pupils equal in size? If they are not equal, which is smaller, which is larger? Doesn't mean smaller is defective or larger is defective. Smaller and larger. Right side is larger, left side is smaller. Now I take him to a dark room. Dark room, but you use an oblique light. Light from below, so it doesn't stimulate the retina, but it enables you to see the pupils and see what happens in darkness. What's this light? So is the anisocoria, the difference between the two eyes, is it more prominent in darkness versus lightness? Then you see, Equality of constriction between the two eyes with light. Okay? Then the reaction to near reflex. And then reaction to psychosensory reflex. Means either you make a loud noise or you pinch the neck. That's psychosensory reflex. Okay? And test for REAPD. That will come to later how to test. But it's how you evaluate the pupil. Okay? So the direct light reflex, how do you do it? First you require a dimly lit quiet room. There's no meaning in using a brilliantly lit room and doing a pupillary reflex because the amount of excursion is going to be restricted because people are already small due to the brilliant light. So from the small light people of about five, four millimeters to come down to two millimeters, the excursion is not easily appreciated by you well. But if you start with the six millimeter people, you can have excursion better appreciated. So use a dimly light people, a dimly light room. So if in the some of you, I'm sure, are interested in appearing for a first exam. In the Indian exams, I don't think they are going to ask you to demonstrate people with light reflex. But in the first years, they will definitely ask you. When they ask you, you should ask the examiner, can I dim the lights? You have to ask. If you don't ask, that's all you have failed. All right? Then there should be a distant fixation target. So you don't want near reflex to get confused with light reflex. You want to eliminate near reflex, so ask him to look at a distance. Okay, then 
the subject should not attempt to close the eye. When you try to open the eyelids, some people intuitively are very resistant to that. The minute you put your thumb on the upper eyelid, they start squeezing. Squeezing can bring in Westphal Pilz phenomena, and that can confuse your pupillary reaction assessment. You use a relatively bright light source, that is, like a binocular inlet ophthalmoscopic light, is okay with the full illumination. And you use a second dim light. So in the examination, you should always have two torches to demonstrate the pupillary reflex. One good torch, another can be a little dim, or keep it a little dim, adjustable the variety, not just on-off variety. Keep dim light. So dim light is meant to visualize the pupils. Bright light is meant to stimulate the pupils, okay? And you shine it directly into the pupil, not from the side, obliquely. Because you want maximum stimulus to the pupillary motor fibers. In bright light, you'll get it only with the fovea, right? Then two terms, pupillary capture versus the pupillary escape. Pupillary capture is when you throw light, the pupil becomes small and keeps being small. Pupillary escape is you throw light, it actually becomes starts dilating. That's pupillary escape. Or it consistently immediately starts to dilate. Okay, that is escape. You also see the latency and the speed of pupillary construction, contraction. Consensual, bright light in one eye, observe the fellow eye. Okay, so you put an oblique and dim light on the fellow eye and throw the light on this eye and keep examining this pupil. That is consensual. It's very useful when a one eye, when the pupil is damaged due to some injury, etc. Use a fellow eye to evaluate it. So the common question asked is, one eye, for example, is, is pupillary damage or aniridia, for example, traumatic aniridia. I want to test the pupil on the right side as well as the left side. What do I do? I throw light on the right side first and just inspect the left pupil. Then I shift the light to the left side and still look at the left pupil. But I have only one pupil as a as effector organ. I don't have both pupils as effector organs, okay? But depending upon which eye is being illuminated, its afferent pathway is being tested at that point of time, not the people you are looking at. This is a confusion among people in general, okay? Is that clear? Anybody has a little clarity, difficulty in understanding that? I can explain once more. Okay, testing for REAP, this is the next most important thing. Relative afferent pupillary defect is where absolute defect is probably not very much subtle. You can still find out that by using the relative afferent pupillary defect. Absolute defect, one eye is no, no PL due to optic atrophy. Then you throw light on that pupil, it immediately dilates. You shift the light to the other side, the other side pupil you, you stimulate it constricts. This is dilating pupil, it's pupillary escape. So it's got to be afferent effect. So you don't need RAPD for that. But RAPD is, for example, there is a subtle loss of optic nerve function in one eye, full function in the other eye, or there's asymmetry between the two eyes, 80% loss in one eye, 60% loss in the other eye optic nerve conduction, you will get REPD because it's not symmetrical, okay? So that is where, that's the importance of REPD. It's also called as Marcus gun pupil. So you require either unilateral conduction defect or asymmetric conduction defect. Both eyes can have conduction defect, but it should be asymmetric. You can do it by alternate cover test of Keston bomb or by swinging flash test of Levatin. This is what all, most of us do, swinging flashlight test. Okay, if you know that, that is enough. Okay, that is, you take the light, bright light, the indirect ophthalmoscopic equivalent illuminated light, and throw it on one eye and quickly shift it to the other eye. The shifting process should be very fast. That's again very important. Within a matter of three to five seconds, you must shift it to the other eye. And light should be kept for equal amount on both sides. So you keep it for about four to five seconds. Quickly shift it to the other eye, keep it for four to five seconds. And repeat it several times. That's why it's called swinging flashlight test. You don't have to bring it down and do it. You can go across the nose, okay? Quickly and stimulate the other eye. Okay, within three to five seconds, you should stimulate the other eye, all right? If you keep longer in one eye and shorter in the other eye, means you're not able to see it properly. You keep it here for five seconds and you keep it for 15, 20 seconds come back five seconds, come back 20 seconds. What happens? We get a relative def defect because the retina which is getting adapted to the light 
the pupil starts to dilate a little bit. So you get in relation to this, it becomes a relative defect. That's why it's important to stimulate equally both eyes. Is that clear? And light must be along the visual axis. Suppose there is a case where you are having difficulty in seeing RAPD, but you intuitively think there could be RAPD, you can bring it out. In fact, you should do it as a routine. If you don't have RAPD with regular light, then you do this test called as 0 0.3 neutral density log unit filter. Okay? Which are, ideally speaking, you should all carry that 0 0.3 neutral density log unit filter in your pocket. Okay? So, if you place, for well, suppose the difference between the two eyes is 10%, let us say, but the amount of difference is so subtle, I can't detect it with regular RAPD. Now I put 0 0.3 neutral density log filter in front of, let us say, right eye is 100%, left eye is 90%, 95% conduction. I put neutral density filter in front of the 100% eye and repeat the <coughs> swinging flashlight test. I still have the same amount of, that is I don't detect RAPD much. But the minute I shift it to the 90% eye, it gets deteriorated by another 10 to 20% because of the neutral density filter. Okay, so you are now exaggerated the anisocoria or exaggerated the RAPD, not anisocoria, exaggerated the RAPD. Because the difference between the two eyes has become now much more than 5%. But when you have kept the filter in front of the good eye, the difference is still not too much. Actually, you are bringing this almost equal to that eye, so you won't get RAPD at all. This is 95% and this is 100%. If a filter is degrading it by, let us say, 3% image, then 100% has become 97%. This is still 95%. So you actually reduce the difference between the two eyes so you won't get RAPD. But the minute you shift it to this side, it has become from 95%, it's going to come down to 92%. So the difference is now 8%, so you are able to detect it. So using a neutral density filter of 0.3, you can detect a subtle RAPD. Alright? You have to quantify RAPD, ideally speaking. You should quantify it. How do you quantify it? If you use neutral density filters to neutralize it. This is a typical uh, filter which is in steps of 0 0.3 from here to then 0 0.6, 0 0.9, like that, all the way up to 1.2. Okay, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 steps. 6 into 0 0.3 is 1.8, okay. 1.8. So from 0 0.3 to 1.8 is normally available in this bar of neutral density filters. So you place the filters progressively more and keep repeating the swinging flashlight test until you cannot see RAPD anymore. And that is the log unit of neutral density filter. Is it clear? Because most of you would not have been exposed to this test because we don't keep it in the clinic routinely. Many people don't use it at all, but you should know how to do it, okay? The second way of testing for the afferent pupillary defect is something called edge pupil cycle time or EPCT. That is, you put the patient on a slit lamp, take a 0.5 mm wide slit beam, okay, and bring it to the pupillary margin. The minute you bring it slightly internal to the pupillary margin, light goes inside the eye, pupil constricts. The minute pupil constricts, the iris is cutting off the light. So it again dilates. So this is called pupillary cycle. So in a minute, how many times it is cycling, you measure, number, you count it. You can do two ways. Either you can see how much time it takes for the cycle, one cycle to take place, or in a minute you count number of cycles, that's easier. Okay, keep a clock and keep counting the cycles. So each cycle should be around 900 milliseconds, which means one uh, minute divided by 900 milliseconds is about 67 cycles per minute. Roughly one, one cycle a second. Okay, if you get roughly about 60 cycles per minute, then that is normal. But it's not a very sensitive test. Its advantage is when there is only one-eyed patient, you can't do RAPD. Then this is useful. Okay. Feeling uh, drowsy or sleepy? You want me to ask a few questions? I know it's a little dry subject, but you know, you need to know. Something else called as pupil cycle induction test. 
where if you keep a beam of 4.0.5 millimeters, 0.45 is placed horizontally at the lower edge of the pupil, it should induce oscillations like in EPCT. Again, this is not very sensitive. But basically, if somebody asks you, how do you test for afferent pupillary defect? You say swinging flashlight test of Levantin is number one. Edge pupil cycle time is number two. This is not very important, okay? The third thing which people have confusion about is the pharmacological testing of pupil, okay? First I will discuss the pharmacological tests, then we'll see the application later. So you get sort of a repeat uh, talking about the same subject. So cocaine, 10%, is used to diagnose Horner syndrome. How does it act? It blocks by, you have, you know sympathetic pathway now. How many of you remember what is the neurotransmitter at the pre-ganglia and pre-synaptic level and the post-synaptic level for sympathetic and parasympathetic? Anybody knows, you know? Not adrenaline. Sympathetic. And it's still choline for passing. Very good. That's what you should remember, okay? So this here, the epinephrine is there as packets inside the synapse, and then it is released due to sympathetic stimulation. So as soon as it is released, it gets destroyed also by an enzyme, okay? So this cocaine blocks the reuptake of epinephrine. That blocks it from being taken back by the synapse after it is destroyed with enzyme. So you got free epinephrine available for a longer time when you put cocaine 10%. So it releases the neuromuscular junction of the dilator muscle. You check after about half an hour, not after five minutes, not after 10 minutes, after at least 40 to 60 minutes, okay? So a larger pupil dilates and smaller pupil does not dilate or very little due to lack of norepinephrine release, okay? What happens in Horner syndrome? Because of lack of sympathetic stimulus, the pupil becomes smaller. So smaller pupil is the defective pupil, but you don't know before you start testing what, what is Horner's or not. So I'm talking about large people, small people. So in a Horner's case, where the epinephrine is not being liberated enough quantity from the synapse, there's not enough which can be blocked for reuptake by cocaine itself. So the affected people are the smaller people does not dilate, where the larger people dilates, okay? And this ex exaggerated anisocoria is typical of Horner's. There's already anisocoria, you know, one is small, one is large, but it gets exaggerated by putting cocaine. This is diagnostic of Horner's. If this does not diagnose at what level is the lesion, it tells you this Horner's, okay? In general, more than one mm equality is considered positive. Second test is by aprochloridin. Cocaine, unfortunately, is not available in India to be used as eye drops, but some people use aprochloridin for this purpose. Here, the understanding is different. Use 0.5 to 1% aprochloridin, and aprochloridin is a weak alpha-1 adrenergic agonist. Here again, you check after one hour, after installation. It has no effect on normal people. Cocaine dilates normal people. This has no effect on normal people. But because of the denervation supersensitivity in a harness, it produces dilation of the affected people. Cocaine does not dilate the affected people. Aprocolidin dilates the affected people because of the supersensitivity of the people. And this produces a reversal of anisocoria. <coughs> Some of the older textbooks mistakenly used to believe that only the third neuron damage can produce supersensitivity. It's not true. Any neuron produces a person. That's why he diagnoses Horner syndrome. It does not localize the lesion, just like cocaine. Okay? But it produces a reversal of anisocoria, while cocaine produces exaggeration of anisocoria. Remember that point, okay? The third drug we use in Horner's is hydroxyamphetamine. This is what divides between first neuron and second neuron as one group versus third neuron. It cannot differentiate between first and second. There is no pharmacological test for differentiating between first and second neurons. But there's a pharmacological test for first and second neurons one group and third neurons one group, okay? This is used in proven Horner's. First you do do cocaine test or aprocolidin test, diagnosis is Horner's. 
next stage you don't do the second test same day you do it next day okay next day you use amphet hydrox amphetamine it's used in proven hormones it releases norepinephrine from the presynaptic terminal so there must be norepinephrine, norepinephrine packets available at the synapse for hydroxyamphetamine to act okay so a normal eye dilates if there's post ganglionic corners there are no norepinephrine packets there because third neuron is damaged unless there is neurostimulus these the uh, neurotransmitters are not made properly the neurostimulus is lost in third neuron damage but first and second neuron damage does not affect the manufacture of the synaptic vesicles which are dependent upon nutrition from the third neuron only so where the third neuron is intact that means first and second neuron are affected it still dilates like a normal people okay but where the third neuron is affected it does not dilate hence the baseline anosocoria becomes worse in a third neuron damage is this clear any problem in understanding okay good just to recapitulate cocaine and aproclonidine are used to diagnose harners cocaine dilates a normal people because it blocks the reuptake of phenylephrine from the released from the third neuron synapse and it dilates the, nor the normal people but does not dilate any harners first second third neuron and hence anisocoria is exaggerated uh, aproclonidine what does it do it because of super sensitivity it can only dilate an abnormal people not a normal people and hence anisocoria is reversed but again it doesn't localize any harness hydroxyamphetamine differentiate between first and second neuron versus third neuron where it releases norepinephrine it is not like hydroxy not like uh, aproclonidine where it stimulates it uh, it uh, it stimulates directly because it's a adrenergic agonist itself okay so it directly stimulates the muscles because it is the muscles are super sensitive now to adrenergic drug while here it needs still norepinephrine in the third the synapse so that is present only when the third neuron is intact and hence post ganglionic harness it fails to dilate is it clear okay so this again to recapitulate we got first and second neuron preganglionic third neuron is called postganglionic third neuron is intact synapse has normal norepinephrine packets but not released cocaine prevents uptake of released norepinephrine so does not act on the affected eye and as a query exaggerated aproclonidine is a weak adrenergic agonist dilates affected people normalizes anisocoria and this is unaltered anisocoria is unaltered in hydroxyamphetamine okay while here anisocoria is exaggerated these two remain the same is it clear dilute pilocarpine is also used as a pharmacological test 0.1% it detects super sensitivity to cholinergic drugs hence it differentiates a dysmyotonic people from a third nerve palsy okay the patients presenting with the dilated people could be because of a dysmyotonic people or due to third nerve palsy So if we put a drop of 0.1% dilute pilocarpine, at least many other people constricts because it is super sensitive to parasympathetic system. 0.1% pilocarpine normally does not constrict a normal people. You require at least 1%. Okay, larger abnormal people becomes smaller. Pilocarpine 2% is also used as a pharmacological test. Suppose somebody accidentally dilated the people with atropine. Okay, I told you no nurses or attendants of patients whom you prescribe atropine drops they put drops in the house and they forget to wash their hands rub their eyes they get atropinized so they come next day with the dilated people so you if you put pilocarpine 2% a dilated people due to parasympathetic paralysis will constrict while a dilated people due to atropine will not constrict there's a easy way of differentiating okay coming to near reflex <coughs> so near reflex some people call it as a near synkinesis 
because it has three components accommodation convergence and pupillary constriction but they are not each is not influencing the other it's not that because accommodation is occurring by is converging or because pupil is constricting it's converging no they are three put together by supranuclear influences and they don't cause each other because technically you can actually separate them by suppose you use prisms you put base out prisms there's apex in then you can induce convergence right but there's no accommodation likewise if you put minus lenses it can induce accommodation but there is no convergence and presbyopia what is presbyopia is reduced accommodation but there is normal convergence and normal meiosis not mitosis again bill gates at work so the pathway for near reflex the final common pathway is edinger westphal nucleus onwards it's the same edinger westphal nucleus oculomotor now ciliary ganglion and onto the uh, ciliary muscle and pupil afferent stimulus here is mostly from the retina but goes all the way to occipital cortex because you need to see the object in order to converge onto it right you need to get the retinal blur for a competitive stimulus you need to get the diplopia to get the convergence stimulus so that's why you require occipital cortex input and the, there is also some people believe there is a cortical center for accommodation at the lateral sylvian area on the temporal lobe potentially the afferent could also be from the medial rectus because if you stimulate convergence accommodation occurs okay cells that respond to accommodation stimuli these are and don't worry about this accommodation plus cells and vergence plus cells both are accommodation vergence there three kinds of cells have been described in the occipital cortex parasympathetic versus sympathetic influence on accommodation this is very simple sympathetic doesn't have much influence on accommodation most of the accommodation is driven by parasympathetic system that doesn't mean sympathetic system doesn't innervate ciliary body it does but the influence is very little clinically circular fibers predominantly stimulated by parasympathetic while longitudinal radial fibers are predominantly stimulated by sympathetic clinically however adrenergic agents do not help to relax accommodation as much as anticholinergic do you can get dilated to people with phenylephrine on top of a homotropine or tropicamide or cyclometolate but you won't get accommodation loss with phenylephrine you will get only with anticholinergics homotropine is required tropicamide is required for accommodation paralysis that's what is i mean okay to relax accommodation you require anticholinergic sympathomimetics do not produce much accommodation relaxation okay certain definitions called depth of focus near point of accommodation near point of convergence and range of accommodation if it's becoming too toxic you don't want me to continue i can stop we can continue in another class maybe next next month when i come back or this week if minachi gives you but if it's okay with you i'll continue to finish it off what do you want okay, okay? still you're not uh, intoxicated fine okay so the depth of focus is the range in which an object is seen without a blur for a fixed accommodation this is very important don't confuse depth of focus with amplitude of accommodation okay it is important your accommodation is the same but still you can see images little beyond little below in front and beyond okay that is called depth of focus you always increase the depth of focus when you make the people a little small right so don't confuse this with range of accommodation near point of accommodation is the closest point that can be sharply focused on the retina near point of convergence is the closest point where fusion of two images is made possible and the range of accommodation is the distance between the far point and the near point so range of accommodation varies between from pay, from the, based upon your prior refractive error itself if you take a a, a five diopter a, a one diopter myope his far point is at 1 meter right and near point is at so let us say 30 cm so his range of accommodation is 1 Minus thirty or hundred minus thirty, okay. While well, emetrope has a far point which is at infinity and thirty centimeters, so his range of accommodation is very long. Okay, the so range depends upon distance point as well. 
far point as well. Other things you should require understand is convergence. There are varieties of convergence. It's not as if it is tonic plus accommodative plus fusional plus proximal plus voluntary is a total convergence. That is wrong way of knowing. It is that the convergence that is stimulated, it is occurring in a particular circumstance is divided. Tonic is basically the normal tone because if you, if a person is dead or in very deep anesthesia, the people's eyes diverge. That is a normal tone. That is what is the normal position of rest of an eyeball, which is totally unconnected, uninfluenced by any neurological stimulation. Because that is how the orbits are located, that is how the orbital fat is located. So normally the eyeball is likely to be a little exotropic, given no neurological stimulus. That happens when a person is dead or in very deep anesthesia, right? But there is something called a tone, normal tone, which keeps the eyes straight. Okay, so that bit is called as tonic convergence. Accommodative convergence is a convergence you measure by or induced by accommodation, accommodative target. Fusional convergence is what you measure by using a fusional target. Fusion, accommodative convergence, when you take a accommodative target like a Snellens, mini Snellens chart and bring it from farther to closer, the convergence you are producing is actually accommodative. Okay? You can actually measure the accommodative convergence by doing that way. Fusional convergence is more to fuse two images together. Like in synaptophore, you bring two images together, that becomes a fusional convergence. Okay? A proximal convergence is my knowledge of the fact that this my finger is close to me allows me to converge. I don't have to actually physically see it. That is called proximal convergence. Voluntary convergence is without any stimulus I can converge my eyes. That is voluntary convergence. All right? These are the five ways you can converge. Again, please don't mistake me that don't think that total convergence is 100 of which 20 is this, 20 is this, 20 is not like that. Okay? Just the way you induce the convergence is what I'm talking about. So what is the effect of ciliary muscle contraction? There's something called why does the what happens during accommodation? People become small, no doubt. Eyes converge, no doubt. But the lens becomes more convex, right? Which surface of the lens moves? Anterior. Yes. The posterior surface remains the same. Anterior surface moves forward. That's why anterior chamber becomes a little shallow, right? It becomes more convex now, more biconvex than before. It's always biconvex, but it's more biconvex now than before. And hence, it's able to converge the light more. But why does it happen? The ciliary muscle is contracting. The ciliary muscle is contracting. Why should it become more biconvex? It's because the zonules are actually relaxing when the ciliary muscles are contracting. And when they relax, because of the way the ciliary muscle is located and zonules are located, when they are relaxing, the lens achieves or acquires its normal inherent shape or elasticity. The inherent lens elasticity is biconvex. It's, it's actually the accommodation which keeps it. There's no lack of accommodation, ciliary muscle contraction, which is, keeps it, lack of ciliary muscle contraction, which keeps it in this position, okay? The lens becomes more convex, and hence it's inherent lens and lens just come back now. Diameter of the lens also is reduced circumferentially. The normal lens is about 10 millimeters in diameter that reduces. And the center of the lens actually drops down by about 0 0.3 millimeters because the lax zonules, gravity pulls it a little down. Okay? How do you test the near pupil reflex? Again, normal room light, <coughs> fixation at 6 meters, and refix at a near accommodative target. Don't give your pencil and ask them to look at the, or your finger and say, now look here. That is not the way you test near reflex. You should test them by showing an accommodative target. Finger is not a commodity target, right? Use an oblique illumination to see the pupillary size. So far about physiological variations, how to test the pupil, pharmacological testing, near reflex testing. Now we come to abnormal pupil. This is the last part, okay? So first is anisocoria, or unequal size of the pupils. We already said 12% of normals have. Here there is another literature which is 20%. 
can have detectable anisocoria. Okay. Polychoria is a term used to describe multiple pupils. But most eyes with polychoria are pseudopolychoria. A really true polychoria means you have two pupillary sphincters, which is almost never seen. Most con conditions are caused by iris being torn, either because iris is pulled to one side due to one of the iridocorneal dysgenesis syndromes, okay, or due to injury, etc. It's pulled to one side and produces pupillary hole, I mean iris hole on the other side, which causes multiple holes, okay. Structural defects of the pupil or iris can occur in a variety of congenital disorders like aniridia, colobomas, the conditions described like square pupils, elliptic pupils, ectopic pupils, persistent pupillary membranes, polychoria, I told you already, congenital meiosis, midriasis. These are all self-explanatory. I don't have to describe them, okay? You can also get structural disorders because of trauma, infection, uveitis, acute angle closure glaucoma, herpes zoster typically produces sectorial iris atrophy, okay? Next is RAPD. We all know now how to demonstrate RAPD, right? How does it occur in various lesions that we know of? Start with optic nerve. Any optic nerve disorder usually produces significant demonstrable RAPD. 0 0.3 to 3 log units you expect. If you measure the log unit and the neocontinental density filters, up to 3 log units you expect difference between the two of RAPD. It occurs when it is unilateral disease or asymmetric disease. Very important to understand. If a bilateral symmetric disease, you may not get RAPD. Act, it may be optic nerve disorder. Okay. It correlates well with extent of field effect for compressive and ischemic lesions, but not for inflammatory lesions. That's why you may have an optic neuritis with relatively well-preserved field, but you still get a very significant RAPD. But you have an ischemic optic neuropathy or a compressive lesion of the optic nerve, optic nerve tumor, then the degree of RAPD is what you expect looking at the field effect. When I lost 90% field loss, you get significant field effect. 10% field loss, you get less RAPD. Okay? LHON, called Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, traditionally in the books they describe that pupils are not are minimally affected. But again, people have seen that it is not probably true. Greater the field effect, greater the RAPD. Traumatic optic neuropathy, we use sometimes an RAPD as a clue to prognosticate. If you have RAPD of less than 2.1 log units, it's associated with worse, I mean, not less than, more than 2.1 log units, it is associated with worse visual outcome after IVMP. Okay? RAPD uh, versus various lesions. Retina, gross retinal disorders such as total RD, ischemic central retinal occlusion can produce RAPD. Macular disorders produce very small RAPD, you cannot detect it clinically. Okay? Field defects correlates with severe field loss. Unilateral glaucomas, severe field loss, you get RAPD. Okay? Chiasma lesions, only if it's asymmetric field loss, you get RAPD. So one eye, there's, there's more field, uh, bitemporal effect, no doubt. But one eye, there is more effect than less. In the other eye, you get RAPD. Optic tract, you can get minimal RAPD in eye with temporal defects. So if there's a right optic tract, that means left homonema semi-defect, left side temporal field loss, right side nasal field loss, right? So the eye with temporal defect, you may get little RAPD. Okay? Due to more crossed pupillomotor fibers than uncrossed are differential sensitivity of temporal to nasal retina. Both explanations are given. Some people say temporal field is probably more than the nasal field. Right? Because you get an additional 30 degrees of temporal crescent over and above the central binocular field of 120 degrees. Right? You get 60, 60 horizontally. So you got 120 degrees circle, which is binocular, and 30 degree temporal field extra. So beyond the nasal field, temporal field has got 30 degrees extra. And hence, you can get a relative affluent pupillary effect between left and right, because left eye is having larger temporal field lost. Right eye nasal field is a little less lost. But that's probably not accepted by everybody's explanation. 
If a pretectal lesion, you can get contralateral RAPD without vision loss or field loss. Means you get pupillomotor fibers knocked off differently between the two sides. But vision fibers escaped because the lesion is after, before, I mean after it has come off from the optic tract. That area is affected. Then you get RAPD, but the vision is equal and good. Amblyopia and macular diseases, very little or no RAPD. Okay? If you have a dense cataract, you get something very surprising. See, technically a dense cataract should act like a very dense neutral density filter, right? So you should actually expect on the side of cataract a significant RAPD. It's like putting a dense neutral density filter, but you don't get it. Because the photoreceptors get adapted to the dim light over a period of time. Because the cataract is not occurring overnight. It's occurring over a period of time. So it gets adapted so much so it's very hypersensitive to light. So much so that you get RAPD in the fellow eye, not on this side. Okay? Because bright light you apply on this eye, it is too bright for the retina compared to fellow eye. So it, you get a RAPD in the fellow eye in dense cataracts. Okay? If you patch an eye, you get a minimum RAPD, minimal RAPD in the non occluded eye. Okay? Again, for the same reason. The occluded eye becomes little more sensitive. Bernick's hemianopic people, that is light on the seeing half of the retina produces reaction. When shifted to the blind half of the retina, it produces RAPD. That means, technically speaking, you close this eye and I've got, say, temporal hemianopia, which means nasal retina is not working, temporal retina is working. I shift the beam from the nasal side to temporal side, back and forth, I should be able to get RAPD. That is what Vernick originally described, it's called Vernick's hemianopic people, but it is never clinically seen in the of eye chain. Okay. Uh, difficult to demonstrate clinically because of light scattering. Okay. Let's come to Harner syndrome. Harner syndrome, we already discussed, is sympathetic paralysis. It's manifested by mild ptosis because of the effect on other muscles as well, orbital muscles as well. And also, there is a raised level of the lower eyelid, so the pupil, the interpalpable fish actually becomes narrow because of ptosis and raised lower lid as well, both. But the ptosis is usually always mild because there is always good LPS action. There is apparent enough thalmos because of the pupil, the palpable fish being narrow, not because our eyeball has gone back. Meiosis, yes, people is smaller in size. And anisocoria is worse in darkness. So sympathetic problems produce anisocoria, which exaggerates in darkness, and parasympathetic problems the other way around. Okay? There's also this dilation lag. That is, you switch off the lights and check the pupil, how quickly it is dilating. It dilates very slowly. And you can augment it by psychosensory stimulus. A loud noise or pinching the neck or press over the McBurney point. It produces psychosensory stimulus. Then you get to exaggerate the dilation lag as well as anisocoria. Hypochromia iris occurs in congenital Harner syndrome because that's when it requires sympathetic, sympathetic tone for the melanocytes to mature properly. While acquired Harner's doesn't produce hypochromia iris. You can get less sweating on one side or hypohydrosis. But the distribution of the sweat, less sweating will vary bet between pre and post ganglionic. So in uh, pre ganglionic or where the internal carotid artery area and below it's affected, you get the entire half of the face can be having hypohydrosis. While if only it's post ganglionic, you get only in the distribution of the somewhere here above the eyebrow. There is minor effect or no effect on the accommodation. We already discussed this, but I will go quickly over what is called central harness, that is segment one. What is segment one? Up to? Very good, okay. You demonstrated you were awake when I presented that, all right. So the associated CNS signs are contralateral hemiplegia can occur. You can get hypothalamus thalamus lesions. Along with the fourth neural palsy, it can occur in midbrain. Means if, 
you can get trochlear nerve paralysis along with uh, sympathetic paralysis in the midbrain area. Wallenberg syndrome, most of you in MBBS would have been asked that question. That is wedge-shaped in fact in the lateral part of the medulla oblongata, also so-called lateral medullary syndrome. It produces bulbar signs with pain and sensation disturbance along with sympathetic palsy. Spinal cord lesions such as myelitis, vascular problems, neoplasm, all these can produce segment one involvement, okay? Segment two is still preganglionic. It's called preganglionic. That's called central. The whole thing is actually preganglionic. That is central. Preganglionic is from the pseudospinal bundle of budge to superior cervical ganglion. Here, most of the lesions in the thorax and neck can cause it. 25% are caused by malignancy. The pancos tumor, which is the apex of the lung cancer, which infiltrates. In 28%, the cause may not be known. Tumors behind the carotid sheath can produce hoarse voice, and injuries due to surgeries in the upper chest can also produce, like even coronary bypass being done, can produce uh, sympathetic paralysis, okay? And segment three, the postganglionic is mostly caused by vascular lesions. It's very important because segment two, if you find it's more likely to be due to tumors, etc., etc., which you have to exclude. Segment three is more likely due to vascular lesions, like uh, dissecting carotid aneurysm. Okay, our tumors in the neck can also press, the, press on the nerve. Lesions in the base of the skull are associated with the damage to other cranial nerves. Damage to superior cervical can occur in palate and tonsil surgeries. And of course, the petrous temporal fracture can produce damage to this as well. Okay. You can also get post ganglionic hornets in the cavernous sinus because there it's along the internal carotid artery, and, but it affects the other oculomotor nerves. Okay? While a carotid aneurysm typically produces sympathetic paralysis along with abducent paralysis because that is what is first pressed in the cavernous sinus. Only then the third, fourth get affected. So isolated sixth nerve palsy along with sympathetic palsy could be because of a ipsilateral carotid aneurysm. Okay? Cluster headaches typically can produce again post ganglionic sympathetic paralysis. Reader syndrome is nothing but paratrigeminal neuralgia. It's a syndrome caused by many disorders that also can produce sympathetic paralysis. Parasympathetic, if it's nuclear, you get other oculomotor nerves affected. It's not just pupillomotor fibers, but you get other motor nerves also affected. Nuclear, because these are closely placed. Okay? Simple. Isolated Edinger westphal nucleus affection is very difficult to believe it will occur, okay? So, if you see the third nerve nucleus, which is located like this, the dorsal nucleus, medial nucleus, inferior. If you remember right, the dorsal nucleus supplies medial rectus, medial nucleus supplies inferior rectus, inferior nucleus supplies superior rectus, okay? And laterally, it supplies inferior oblique. And then you have the caudal central nucleus, which is common. It produces for LPS, levator palpi superioris. And Edinger westphal nucleus is next to it, like here, more rostral to it. So one of these will be affected along with the pupillomotor fibers. Okay? So rostral midbrain lesions can affect pupillomotor fibers very rarely in isolation because it is rostral to the oculomotor nucleus. So it's a small tumor, it can affect just the pupillomotor fibers due to ischemia, hemorrhage, and infiltration. Fascicle is a term you use for the nerve fibers which are still inside the, uh, the cortex. It's not come out like a peduncle or a brachium, but they're still inside. That part is called fascicle. So before it emits or exits the uh, midbrain or, or pons or whatever it is, it's called fascicle. Superficially located pupillary fibers can be selectively affected in basal meningitis as well. Okay? Sclerosis from CSF hemorrhage can also produce effect of the pupillomotor fibers. In the subarachnoid space, pupil is affected with other muscles. As in Urizum, I already told you this. Pupil with other bands of oculomotors are affected along with sympathetic palsy in cavernous sinus. Okay? So all these are permutations and combinations that can occur. The tonic pupil is the next commonly asked question. You can have what's called local tonic pupil caused by damage to ciliary ganglia due to viral infections, syphilis, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, giant cell arthritis, injury, etc. Okay? They can 
diamine ciliary ganglion directly. In fact, the most common uh, edis myotonic you see acquired, I mean, in the, in the clinic is after a viral infection like herpes zoster, etc., etc. You can get or chicken pox. Uh, you can get uh, tonic pupils. Okay. Neuropathic is more bilateral. It's a part of a widespread peripheral autonomic neuropathy, like diabetic, you know, diabetes, systemic lupus erythematosus, alcoholism, ML autism, etc., etc. This is bilateral. But what is more common is Eddy's syndrome. Eddy's pupil is different from Eddy's syndrome. Eddy's syndrome is where it is seen in otherwise healthy adults. There are no neurological problems. Not a diabetic, no GCA, no injury, etc. 70% are women. And there is also hyporeflexia. Deep tendon reflexes are reduced. And you get the tonic pupil. Tonic pupil is basically the pupil is larger in size and it reacts very slowly. That's why it's called tonic pupil. Okay? It presents as dilated pupil. It reacts very slowly both to light and near. And there can be light near dissociation depending upon differential re innervation. Because the damaged ciliary ganglion tries to re innervate, and re innervation is never like what God meant. So it differentially uh, re innervates. So it can innervate sometimes the light near dissociation. It can also produce the vermiform motion because of that reason. Okay? Sectorial contractions occur. And it's also cholinergic supersensitivity. So 0.1 percent pilocarpin will constrict the people which normally should not constrict. These are the components of Eddy's tonic pupil, right? Pharmacological pupil is where the pupil got dilated or constricted because of installation of some medication intentionally or accidentally. Okay? As I said, I already told you about this. And insecticides containing like people who spray pesticides, farmers and all, they can sometimes get affected with these and produce meiosis. Other thing which you are asked in light near dissociation. Okay? That is light reflex is intact, but near reflex is damaged. Okay? You can get an Argel Robertson people, get in pre-geniculate blindness. Pre-geniculate means before the lateral geniculate body. If blindness is caused, then you can get light near dissociation also. Okay? Compressive and infiltrative lesions of midbrain. It's like one eye is a blind eye, pupillary reaction is gone, but near reflex will be present. Right? You get REAPD. So Argel Robertson people, some books describe it, typical, atypical, and pseudo, three terms they use. Typical Argel Robertson people is described with neurosyphilis. Okay? It has a retina which is still sensitive to light unless there's a superadded optic neuropathy also, then of course you have REAPD. But in the absence of optic neuropathy due to Argel Robertson, due to syphilis, like tabis tarsalis can have tabitic optic atrophy. Then you get retina, which is still sensitive to light, but no light illustrated pupil reflex, but near reflex is intact. Okay? Dilates purely poorly with atropine. Biotic pupils and irregular pupils due to postis and key. So there's a light near dissociation. Okay? Pseudo AR people is. There's aberrant regeneration of fibers after third nerve palsy. Here what happens is fibers meant for medial rectus also go to the pupil. So in convergence, the pupil reacts because the fibers have gone to the pupil. Basically, pupil was paralyzed to start with. Okay, the pupil was dilated. But in the re innervation process, the fibers going to the medial rectus have gone to the pupil as well. So whenever he converges, the pupil constricts. But if he is not converging and you throw light, the pupil doesn't react. Okay, that is pseudo AR people, right? And in Hutchinson's, that is about pseudo AR. Well, atypical AR people is basically non syphilitic causes like diabetes, etc., can also produce a AR type of people sometimes, okay, where it does not react to light but reacts to near, okay? Then Hutchinson's people is seen in intracranial space. I think this is probably the last slide. You can relax now. I'm finishing it. So it's seen in intracranial space occupying lesions. So this is important if you are called to evaluate the pupils in a 
comatose patient. You can see up to stage two is reversible. After that, it is not reversible. The patient is gone into a coma, which cannot come back. So if there is a space occupying lesion, which is irritating the ipsilateral oculomotor nerve, is irritating, it's not paralyzing it, the people become small, okay? But other side people is normal. But now it's pressing it more and more, now it's get paralyzed. At the same time, it's irritating the contralateral oculomotor nerve because the whole brain is shifted to the opposite side. So you get ipsilateral paralysis, dilated people, and contralateral meiosis. That is stage two. Stage three, both oculomotor nerves are conquered off. Both people dilate, okay? That is three stages of Hutchinson's people. If I remember right, there is also a syndrome called Claude Bernard syndrome, which is the reverse of Horner syndrome, which is at the irritating stage before it is paralyzed, where you can get a pupillary dilation rather than constriction. Okay, that's it. So I'm sorry if I have taken very long time, but there's no way I could have compressed it for uh, less than this time. Any questions? No, no, no. It's just a question to tell you that physically, an intracranial lesion can affect first. First and third. Yeah. Together. together I, it's not together. It can affect first as well as third. That's what I meant. I did say not, I didn't say together because it's very difficult to expect the third neuron and first neuron to be next to each other. It's not possible. First neuron is starting from hypothalamus and immediately going into spinal cord. While third neuron is everywhere else. They both are not next to each other. So you can't get the same lesion causing both problems unless you knock off the entire brain. Right? So here we are talking about A intracranial lesion can cause first nerve, A intracranial lesion can cause third, or B can cause third. That's what I meant in the question. Okay? Sir, uh, the light near dissociation is basically because of the efferent uh, pathway defect. So efferent pathway defect. Efferent, yes, sir. It is all near the pretectors. Yes, sir. Pretectal, where the near reflex uh, fibers are a little more rostral than the light reflex fibers. In AD's pupil, we know that the lesion is uh, near the ciliary ganglion, like it is the distal part of the efferent pathway that is affected. So how are we getting a uh, light near dissociation in case of AD's pupil? Can you please explain one more, once more? AD's pupil? Why are we getting light near dissociation? Is the path, final pathway that it is, is it for... Is same pathogenesis like the pseudo-AR people, basically in a de, de re -innervation. After it is myotin, people also there is a re innervation taking place. The re innervation is, can, can, can cause a problem of uh, differential stimulation or the uh, differential pupillary stimulation, depending upon where the lesion is. But if you ask me precisely, why is it that unlike pseudo R people, of course, the oculomotor nerve is affected? Here, if the ciliary ganglion is affected, ideally it should not happen. But if the AR people is, is, is occurring because of lesions beyond, like an autonomic neuropathy, then probably it can theoretically happen, where it can, it can affect you, it can affect... Uh, wait a minute, let me put the, put the answer in the correct perspective. Let me get you the answer. I have the electronic version of uh, Walsh and Hoyt, I can give you that. Uh, 